record button. So welcome to Rising Coaches, uh, All Access Coaches Corner. Uh, if you haven't been to risingcoaches.com yet, go to www.risingcoaches.com. Ton of great features, memberships, uh, really inexpensive, but get a lot of uh, quality uh, opportunities to connect with other coaches, uh, learn from other coaches, uh, and just be a part of a big coaching tree and network. So check, definitely check that out. But excited today to have uh, Loyola, Maryland's head coach, head men's basketball coach, Tavares Hardy, longtime friend. I'll let, I'll let Aaron jump in first and, and, uh, and introduce him and tell a good story. And then I'll, I'll yeah. piggyback and then we'll get started. Well, I've known T since 1999, going to Northwestern. Um, just somebody who's a big brother to me, somebody who's always looked up to, was a leader for our team, um, and then continued to kind of try to follow in some of the footsteps that he's been um, going along and the moves that he's made and the success he's had um, as a basketball coach, as a father, everything else. And so someone I just, um, for the rest of my life, I'll look up to. So. Yeah, great, great stuff. Not, I don't know if many people can say that, Aaron, but I love that you did. Uh, he paid you well for that. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I was at his wedding, and one of the coolest things I ever saw him do was sing to his wife at his <laughs> wedding. That was, a, that was an amazing show. So, <laughs> Lip sync, Aaron. Yeah. <laughs> okay, lip sync, but still yeah, it was I good. Thank you, though, because a lot of yeah. people thought I was singing for real, but Lenny Williams, I can't do it. <laughs> well, if those that haven't seen, you know, Coach broke out his dance moves. Uh, not too long ago, about a year ago, right, Coach? At uh, at practice and, and broke really? the internet, went went viral, broke the internet. But uh, Coach is always about having fun. Uh, definitely a well-known recruiter. Has coached in the Big Ten, has coached in the ACC, has coached um, at Georgia Tech, as Coach mentioned earlier. Coached at Northwestern, his alma mater, where he was an All Ten, All Big Ten performer himself. Uh, he actually played with my older brother, so he's been like family for. A long time. I've been like the little brother that they beat up when we tried to go play pickup up there and put in the headlock. We actually played them uh, this year, IUPUI. We, we weren't on the winning side of that, so credit to Coach and his uh, job well done. And I think the first time I saw him, he picked me up and put me in a body slam right away. So always having fun. Um, definitely a high-level coach, not just a recruiter. Uh, has already got the program in Loyola, jump-started. Uh, has done a tremendous job recruiting. Has already gotten some signature wins and uh, the best is yet to come for his program. So definitely excited to have him on here today. Um, really, really sharp dude. Uh, even though he's so funny, you wouldn't know he's intelligent as he is. So he's about to show that off today. Uh, so the order of today, we'll go, uh, we will go kind of a small interview real quick. And then after that, we'll do questions and answers from the group. And then after the question and answer, we'll go straight to his basketball presentation and then do one more question and answer after. So. All that being said, I'm going to be quiet and introduce uh, head coach of Loyola, Maryland men's basketball program, Tavares Hardy. Uh, thank you, Brian, uh, for the intro. I mean, you hit everything right on, right on the head. Uh, AJ, appreciate you. Uh, funny story, you know, I'm not going to tell too many stories about me and AJ because we were in college for three years together. You know, we both have jobs. We both have families. <laughs> we're not trying to lose any of it. Uh, but I will say, you know, I learned, I thought I learned my lesson when I was a kid. Uh, my sixth grade teacher, Mr. Carter, you know, I was, I used to make fun of him all the time because he, he was one of them bigger dudes that had all the wrinkles in the back of his head. And I used to always clown him. And then when I got older, man, I don't even want to turn around. Like I got exactly what I used to make fun of him for. <laughs> and so I say that to say, AJ, I've never even told you this. We used to make fun of AJ in college because one of his legs was like an inch longer than the other one. So he ran a little funny. Uh, but AJ had work. He was 6'11", could shoot, could dribble. Like he was like the original versatile big. But AJ, you know, I'm starting to walk with a little limp. And I, I've noticed, you know, from making fun of you, just like Mr. Carter, now one of my legs is longer than the other. So <laughs> for all you young coaches, don't, don't make fun of people. That's, <laughs> that's the uh, – that's the lesson of the day. But uh, but thank you, Brian. Uh, you want me to go right into my story or you want to ask me questions? Yeah, I'll, I'll ask you a couple questions first. So since you're talking about making fun of people, let's, 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 we got to give a quick make fun of Jason Burke, my brother, uh, uh, my high school teammate. Our parents got married shortly after, uh, shortly after we graduated high school and 
Uh, he was already one of my best friends, if not my best friend. So I'll let Tavares tell a quick, funny story about him that we can go back and talk about how we talk bad about him on on the uh, on the Zoom. I mean that that right there is funny about Jason because <laughs> how, how, how all of a sudden you get to college and you look at your best friend and now y'all are brothers like for real like that that was nuts when he told me that but uh, I got a chance to meet both your parents and uh, you know great family but Jason's my dude man Jason funniest thing about Jason uh, when he got married he had one wish. And uh, y'all, I don't know, y'all probably too young to have seen the Batman TV show where Robin used to ride around in the sidecar. But uh, after Jason, or right before Jason's wedding, he's in the tuxedo. His his fiance, uh, soon to be wife, had a dude pull up, and Jason got in the sidecar and rode around Chicago. It was hilarious. I got the pictures. <laughs> Oh, man, good times, man. So speaking of funny, tell us something funny that you've learned about your family or there's some funny story that happened during the quarantine since we've all been locked in the house and wanted to get out and do something different. Everybody first say, say hello to Allie Quigley, the three or four or five-time WNBA three-point champion, just beat Chris Paul in the, uh, in, in the ESPN uh, horse challenge, WNBA all-star. Good to see you, Allie. <laughs> Thanks for the shout out. I was just wanting to come see your face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, um, we, got, we, got, we got your teammate Ben on here too. So if you got any, if you got anything funny on him you want to share, please do. Yeah, it'll, it'll probably come out in, in my story. But to stick to the script, uh, you know, this quarantine has been, and as I'm sure it's for everybody, obviously there's challenges, but uh, rewarding for us parents uh, to be able to spend this much time with our kids. You think about the amount of time we spent on the road. And I know you guys have heard everybody say this, but I got four kids and I really mean it. Um, I've really enjoyed this time with my wife and kids. But what I'll say is this, uh, Brian, we all truly believe if you put us on top shelf, top chef, I mean, top chef, America's next top model, uh, world's strongest man or woman, because I got two daughters and my wife, like, we really do believe we win all that stuff right now. Like we have been getting it in, in terms of the kitchen, like making what we can make. Uh, you know, we've been having, I've changed my look about 15 times. Like, you know, last week I had my beard out to here. A couple of weeks ago, my whole face and head was shaved off. Like, and, and we've taken pictures, photo shoots. Like we're trying to do it up. We're trying to make the most of this quarantine and, you know, a little bit vain, but, uh, it is what it is. We're, we're enjoying all that stuff. No doubt, no doubt. I've seen some of the footage, so I would say you probably could win on a lot of those shows right now, the way you guys are getting down. But uh, tell us a little bit about your family. I know you just told us a funny story. Tell us a little bit about your family. Yeah, so I uh, met my wife uh, in college uh, early on. She bullied me into our relationship. Um, you know, I was just trying to, you know, go out on a date. And a week later, she was like, so are we a couple or what? And, and, you know, I knew later on that I'd want, it, want to say yes. Yeah, so I said, yeah, right then. And here we go. Here we are. Uh, that was 1998. Um, but, yeah, so we've been together. We got married in 2005 at the tender age of 25. Had our first daughter, first child um, at 27. Uh, you know, shortly after I started my coaching career, um, had another girl a few years later on Halloween. Uh, so we have a 13-year-old and an 8-year-old daughter. Uh, and then, you know, was sweating bullets when she got pregnant again. Uh, you know, I love my girls and I love women's basketball. My wife was a hooper. She played at Northwestern. But, you know, we all want a boy, too. I don't care what anybody says. If you got all girls, you know you want a boy. It's a lie if you don't. Uh, and so when I got to D.C. coaching at Georgetown, we had my first son. Uh, we named him in college. Uh, we named all our kids in college, to be honest with you. Uh, and so he was supposed to be T.J. Hardy. It's supposed to be Tavares Jr. Uh, but then I found out my wife didn't like my middle name. Uh, so he's still T.J., but we combined my name, so Tavares, and then we took her middle name, which is Justina. Uh, uh, Justine, I'm sorry. She can't hear me. I hope she ain't on this. You recording this, V? <laughs> Just, <laughs> Justine. Her email address is Justine, and that's why I said that. But Justine, so it's Tavares Justin. We still got the TJ out of there. Uh, so then we were done. Thought it was over with, but messed around and moved again. And every time we moved, knock on wood, hope it don't happen again. We had another kid. We had our fourth. We had a son, Noah. 
um, who actually we didn't name in college, but we came up with that and we liked it. And uh, so that, that's what we are. We, we're like the Brady Bunch almost. We got two boys, two girls, and uh, just really excited about, uh, about their growth. And I love my wife, so that makes up for me messing up her middle name. Right. <laughs> so you were planning on three in college, it sounds like. You had to come up with one more name afterwards. <laughs> exactly. We had, to, we, had to, we had to figure one out. So tell everybody, obviously, I got to see you playing back uh, in college when you played. Uh, was a really good player for both uh, Kevin O'Neill and Bill Carmody at Northwestern, uh, all Big Ten performer, like I said earlier. Tell us about your playing career a little bit, and then just tell us how you got into coaching and tell us about your journey. Yeah, so, you know, for me, my basketball journey starts, starts young like everybody, but um, I can tell you flat out, like, you know, I wasn't a, a great player growing up. Uh, I was tall. Uh, actually, Sam's boyfriend or uh, husband, <laughs> uh, yeah, was your boyfriend when we met, Sam. Uh, her husband and I grew up together since kindergarten, um, and he was always better than me uh, at every sport. That was my man. Um, but anyway, so, you know, I was okay. But what I'll say is this, and this is – I've said this before. Some of you guys who may have been on other calls have heard me talk, but I really give a lot of credit to both my high school and my AAU coaches. It, it, I never felt like I had to choose either or. Uh, I was able to use both. So my high school coach was more – locked in on, you know, fundamental development and teaching us the defensive principles and understanding the team game and, you know, all the things that we all know we need to be successful. Uh, whereas my AAU coach was like, yo, let's go play anybody <laughs> and, and, and let's figure it out. And so we were playing all over the country against top teams, Atlanta Celtics, Houston Hoops, and uh, everybody else back then. It, it didn't matter which shoe contract you had. We all played each other. And so I say that combination of, you know, developing my skills and learning how to play the game from my high school coach uh, combined with being thrown in the fire with some of the best players in the Chicago land area um, and, and, and having to adapt and grow to be able to compete with those guys really presented the opportunities for me to be able to play Big Ten basketball. Um, and so as, as Brian said, I was recruited by Kevin O'Neill, uh, who's a nut. I love him. Uh, and, you know, toughness, you know, old school recruiting, a thousand letters a day. Um, discipline, like it was, it was a really great experience. I got a chance to play for him for two years. Uh, then he rolled out and went to the New York Knicks and became assistant coach. And they brought in Bill Carmody, who is as complete opposite of Kevin O'Neill in every single way. Um, the way he sees the game, the way he goes about recruiting, <laughs> like it, it was almost like I got a chance to see two completely different scopes, which made me a better player uh, and it's made me a better coach. Um, having a chance to, to see both of those things, um, the way they, they went about their business. Coach Carmody is more offensive-minded, fluid, creative. Uh, Kevin O'Neill is defensive-minded, disciplined, toughness. Um, and, and that combination is sort of who I am as a person and as a coach, uh, to, be, to be quite honest. Uh, after I graduated, so Brian said, you know, I had a good career, went to the postseason, a couple winning seasons at Northwestern, and Northwestern wasn't known for that. Um, so I, I felt good being able to graduate with a couple of winning seasons under my belt because uh, I want to say, you know, in the modern era, they probably – I think they only had like two or three before that total. Um, and so I knew what I was getting into when I chose Northwestern. Um, it was a great academic school. Went on from there, uh, played a year in Europe, great experience, played in Finland. If I could do it all over again, you know, I, I wouldn't trade the experience. I, I met a lot of great people. It was actually an article. <laughs> I just did a story. I mean, this is 20 years later. And there's a story coming out on me uh, in the Finnish newspaper, either today or tomorrow, which is unbelievable. Uh, but made the most of my time over there for one season. Came back, uh, wanted nothing to do with basketball. Uh, uh, and so I took an internship in the private equity world and uh, did the Wall Street thing for three years. It, the reason, I shouldn't say I wanted nothing to do with basketball. I, I thought I still might play. Um, but I wanted to see what would life be like if I didn't play. Um, and, and so once I started heading down that path, then I sort of got the itch to start my life. And uh, so I took a job at J.P. Morgan, worked in their wealth management group for three years, was progressing pretty quickly uh, up the ladder. Um, but it's funny how things work. Uh, this is why I stress to my guys so much about the value of relationships. The commissioner of the Big Ten, one of the most powerful dudes in sports, Jim Delaney, uh, asked me if I would coach his son's AAU team. And I did it, and I did it for fun. I didn't charge any money. I, didn't, I wasn't trying to be a college coach, but I just wanted to be around the game. And so 
that sparked a passion for coaching that I didn't know I had. It also allowed me to be seen by some coaches that I used to coach against, or used to play against. Um, and, and so people started talking to me about college coaching and, you know, it wasn't really something I ever wanted to do, to be quite honest. Um, you know, tell you guys the reason, the main reason I grew up broke and I couldn't imagine myself going back to that life. I didn't have a mom and dad that was going to be able to fund me to live at home and go to grad school and be a GA or, you know, be that grinder dude that, you know, you guys, some of you guys are right now. I didn't have that luxury. Um, and it sounds like a luxury, but it, like, you might be like, they ain't a damn luxury, but uh, I, I couldn't do that. And, and so I was like, I need to make some bread. That's why I wanted nothing to do with coaching. But anyway, before I ramble, it's too long because I know we got a time limit. My story is long and unique in some ways. Uh, I resigned from JP Morgan because I, I wanted more autonomy in my business. I wanted to be able to run I wanted to be able to run my book the way I saw fit. So I took a job. I accepted a job at Merrill Lynch. I told JP Morgan, I'm done June 20th. Told Merrill, I start, I start August 1st. So I can coach my AAU team in July. That's the only reason I didn't want to take vacation. I just wanted to, you know, go coach my team without worrying about it. During that time frame, uh, I get a chance to talk to one of my former coaches, who's an assistant coach at Northwestern at the time, Craig Robinson, uh, who's Michelle Obama's brother. Um, and Craig, I'm talking to him about my, my, my move. He had been in the financial world before, and I'm telling him all about, you know, how I want to be a, uh, I want to run my business. And he was like, you know what? I watched you coach your AAU squad. And he was like, to me, it looks like that's what you need to be doing with your life. You were passionate, you were winning, like you had, you, you had the right temperament. I'm about to get the head coaching job at Brown University. Why don't you become my assistant? And I'm like, Craig, to be honest, like, I ain't moving to Providence, <laughs> you know what I mean? I said, and so I said to Craig jokingly, I said, you know, when you go to Brown, I dropped this financial service stuff uh, to take your job at Northwestern. And I was joking. And uh, Craig called me a week later and was like, yo, Carmen, you want to talk to you about what you said? And so again, I know that's not a, always a relatable story because some people have to take a different path, but that's my story. Uh, that's how I became a college coach. Bill Carmody and I had a conversation. There was no interview, really. We talked about what he wanted, what he needed. Um, and to be honest, I was ready to do it. And uh, I didn't know it. Talked to my girlfriend at the time. And uh, here we are 14 years later. Yeah, very unique story. Very, very unique story. Uh, appreciate you sharing that, Coach. Tell us real quick about uh, some of the Division One moves before we kind of get into Loyola specific. Yep. Uh, and so hit the ground running at Northwestern. One of the reasons I was so comfortable and so confident that I could do it was because I did, I was charged with recruiting uh, from the day I walked through the door. Kevin O'Neill, uh, my first new student weekend, had me hosting a kid who AJ and Ben played with Winston Blake. And Kevin O'Neill said to me, if he leaves this campus, he's not going to come here. He's going to go to Oklahoma um, or Texas or somewhere was recruiting him. I can't remember. And he's like, you got to get him to commit before he leaves this campus. And I was able to do that. Like, I, I hate to say I did it, but I know I put my heart and soul into making sure Winston commit. And uh, that was sort of my first taste of recruiting. And that, that carried on uh, throughout. I hosted Ben on his visit. AJ came with three other tall white dudes from Iowa. So I, I think I hosted one of them. I don't remember which one. They all looked the same. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but that sort of gave me the confidence to be able to tell the story about Northwestern. And so... I coached at Northwestern for seven years, five years as an assistant, two years as associate head coach. Uh, coach Carmody uh, gets let go. Um, I didn't really have a chance to analyze and look around. Uh, I talked to Chris Collins pretty quickly in the process. And, you know, I just, I believed in what we had built. We had built the team. We had went to four straight postseasons. Um, was feeling good about, about everything we were doing. So, you know, part of me wanted to stay and be a, around and, and so I stayed on with Chris Collins uh, for about two months. Uh, and it was great. I, I learned a lot. I, I, I really enjoyed him. But um, it was actually at Jason Burke's wedding. Uh, I got a phone call from John Thompson III. And I'm, I'm a loyal guy. I don't want it to look like I, I ran out on Chris. But I always had that in the back of my mind, like, damn, I've been at Northwestern my entire career. And uh, when I heard from uh, Coach Thompson about the opportunity at Georgetown, we sat down at Brian's brother's wedding and talked about it. We talked it out. 
and we were all going through things. And one of the things one of my guys said was, look, we always all wanted, we all wanted to go to Georgetown. And so I just thought it was a, an unbelievable opportunity to go to one of the premier programs. And uh, so I moved on to there and worked at Georgetown for three years. Uh, then I moved down to Atlanta uh, with Coach Pastner when he was getting started. Uh, worked at Georgia Tech for two before I got this head job here at Loyola. Yeah, awesome. Awesome, man. Um, yeah, you have a diverse high major experience, too. It's, you know, a private school. Uh, Georgia Tech has its own, um, you know, very unique parts to it. And then Georgetown I mean, as well. So you definitely have a well versed uh, background versus if you just would have stayed at Northwestern, you probably wouldn't have the same view and same lens as a head coach now. So uh, credit to you for your career and being able to make those moves. Uh, let's talk Loyola specific, man. Tell us about uh, the place. Tell us about what makes it special. Uh, just kind of give us a little bit of insight to the program. Yeah, I mean, this was, and I'll be, I'll be transparent. You know, I had a few other head coaching interviews in my, over the course of my uh, 12 years as an assistant coach. Um, this was a job that when it opened, I knew I really wanted it. Um, you know, I, I knew that I didn't know if I can get involved. You know, we weren't coming off a great season. We had a great year the year before. Um, but when I got some traction with it, I went after it full steam ahead. Um, I was prepared for it. I knew what it was. Um, and, and I wanted it bad. Uh, and so that's how we got it. Now, if you look at the places I've been, one of the things I was able to articulate to the leadership who, were, who was making the decision here was that, Loyola mirrored a lot of the things that I've been able to uh, do. And uh, I'm sorry, a lot of the mirrored a lot of the places I've been. And so you look at Northwestern, obviously you got the Big Ten, which is different, but city of Chicago, great academic school. You got Georgetown, DC, great academic school, Big East. You got Atlanta, academics at Georgia Tech. And so like Loyola to me with Baltimore, um, with the Patriot League, uh, with the chance to build something um, and do some special things. It was it was a no brainer, and, and that's why I wanted it, and that's why I'm so passionate about us what we're doing here. Um, and so I know I think you got some questions about about you know just the processes and the staff and all that stuff. But I feel like you know being prepared for this opportunity, um, you know, it really helped give me the confidence that and and, and the know that we're going to get this thing done, and we've been able to progress um, in our first couple of years and. And I know that uh, the future is really bright for what we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Seen it firsthand uh, on film, being able to watch you guys and uh, on ESPN as well, being able to watch you guys. And uh, the way you guys play is difficult to guard. I know you've had done a tremendous job in recruiting and getting your own players in there to fit your style of play. And uh, something to major mark in this business doing is recruiting. And uh, the coaching part is the part that most people would be surprised about how good you are at actual coaching. Uh, and I, I mean that in a, in a nice and a complimentary way. But No, you say it because I'm black. Ex exactly. <laughs> we can say it, yeah, the elephant in the room. But uh, most people would expect you to just be a recruiter. Let's call it what it is. And you've been at some uh, high-level institutions that are high academic, as you spoke about. But talk a little bit about, and I know we didn't talk about this question in advance, but just talk a little bit about the versatility of your growth as a coach and even just – you as a head coach, being a, a really good head coach, I know you don't want to say it, but I can say it. Yeah, no, it, it's, again, ha having played for the two coaches that I played for, it sort of built, again, it helped my identity as a player. Even in college, I was I was fine. Like I said, I averaged like 12 a game or seven, seven rebounds, something like that. Um, but I wasn't like a killer. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't on anybody's draft boards and all that type of stuff. I was a grinder. I was a team, good teammate. Uh, you know, I, I was a leader. I can say that. AJ uh, ec uh, said that earlier. I'm just echoing what he said. And so, like, to me, it's the same thing in coaching, right? Um, you know, I view the game from a holistic approach. I think you got to be good offensively and defensively. I'd say, uh, you know, my role as an assistant probably, especially in the later part of my career when I went to Georgetown, um, was more geared towards the offensive side of the ball. Uh, you know, just a product of one of the reasons I think uh, Coach John Thompson wanted to bring me on is because he had a couple other coaches that didn't really know the system. Um, and so I was able to hit the ground and, and sort of take on that offensive coordinator role. Whereas at Northwestern, 
you know, I probably comedy was the man. Like he, I, I, I was more defensive there, uh, you know, making sure our scouts were on point and all that stuff. And so, you know, that's the, the approach I take to, to Loyola is um, we want to be great at everything. And, and, you know, we, we inherited what we inherited. I never bash our players. They're a great group. They fought with us. Um, you know, these first couple of years, we haven't sacrificed who we're going to be for who we wanted to be in the short term. Um, and, and they bought into that. And so we, we've hit some lumps in a row, but I'm really proud of the fact that, you know, offensively and defensively, we've been really able to lay the foundation. Um, you know, we're, we're going to play fast and all that stuff that all these coaches says, but we, we, we run an offense that's not common. Um, and so teaching the guys how to execute the way we want to execute has been fun because um, they've been picking it up. They've been getting better. Uh, we're still, you know, figuring out our defensive identity just in the sense that we, we, we've had to adjust to, to our guys in some ways. We started off one way. Uh, we were getting smacked around. And so uh, the adjustment wasn't in our core philosophy. We're still playing the same way. But we had to adjust and mix in some zones and do some things um, that, that are going to help us be successful. So, um, you know, I got great coaches, uh, great assistant coaches. I know uh, Coach Taj Finger is on, on here um, who has been with us. Uh, Taj played at Stanford. Uh, worked with us at Georgia Tech, uh, then went on and worked in the G League uh, for the Oklahoma City Thunder squad. Uh, actually worked with the Big Thunder for a year too. So he's been great. Um, he's, he's, he's been uh, great with our players, great with our bigs, and, and really trying to help fine-tune our defense. A uh, couple of coaches, Ivo Simovich isn't on, but he's been phenomenal. He's helped us recruit at a level that our league hasn't seen before, to be honest, uh, with some of the international kids we've been able to get. So uh, and then also a great basketball mind. And uh, I think I see Kevin Farrell's on here, uh, director of ops, uh, who's a Loyola guy uh, through and through, uh, loves the place um, and, and has put his heart and soul into, into what we're building. Um, and then Freddie Owens, who, who's not on, um, is, is also on our staff. We played against each other back in the day, played at Wisconsin, but he's, he's been phenomenal uh, player development and, and locked in on, uh, just showing our guys how to do things the right way. So that combination has been fun to work with. No, no, that's great. That's, that's good stuff. And good to have familiarity on staff. Good to have continuity, which you've had. Uh, I'm curious, Coach, a uh, two-part question. One, uh, did you have a vision for how you wanted to build your foundation and kind of go into the early years? Uh, I know you guys have hit the ground running in, in recruiting and had some signature wins and have progressed since you've been there. Just curious if you're going with the plan as you had, or did you have to change the plan? And then secondly, what, what things have you learned in your first couple of seasons uh, in the first year? Yeah. And so I was very uh, direct when I was going through the interview process on, you know, what my vision was, how we were going to do things. And so number one, at the core of who we are at Loyola, and this is, uh, you know, based off the, the, what the experiences I had as a student athlete and, the places I've been, like we are going to be a student athlete first operation. Um, everything we do is about their success. And so our culture is built on pursuing greatness in everything that we do academically, athletically. Uh, and I know everybody say it, um, you know, we take it further to, you know, as leaders and in our impact on the community, we don't, we don't sway from that. Uh, we don't sway from that, that pursuit of greatness uh, in, in what we do. And, and so what I noticed, um, and you guys probably hear me talk about it a little, a little later when I go into my presentation, but, um, you know, I didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Our university mission statement was already built like that. Uh, and, and so, yes, from a holistic philo philosophical standpoint, we haven't, we haven't tried to reinvent the wheel. We've stuck to our guns, and I think it's really helped us. I didn't come in guns ablaze, and I know a lot of people come in and they get rid of the old guys and they tr tell them they weren't shit and that's why they lost and they got their coaches fired and all that type of stuff. That type of language is not tolerated nor desired in our program. Um, you know, I, I told everybody from the start, you know, the cover wasn't bare uh, when I got the job. I had some things to work with. The staff had some pieces to work with. And so, you know, we just tried to live through those core values and help those guys grow and, and then still recruit uh, at the level to which we want to recruit at, which is to be the best recruiting class in our league every year. That's our goal. And, uh, you know, I feel like we've been able to accomplish that so far. Oh, awesome. Yeah, pursuit of greatness and everything you do is definitely kind of one of those cliche things like culture, but not everybody is in 
intentional and consistent about it. It's about the consistency. And um, credit to you guys for what you're doing there. I love it. Uh, tell us something real quick, Coach. Three things, if you had to say so far about yourself as a head coach that's enabled you to be successful. Yeah. Um, and so I'd say I'm trying to go in in order. Um, again, some of this stuff uh, might, might sound cliche, but uh, integrity is first and foremost. Um, you know, I've never compromised my bosses when I was an assistant coach, uh, never compromised our university um, at the various places, uh, never compromised my family. Uh, and, and so that first and foremost has allowed me to progress. I've, I've, I've sort of, I'd say probably number two is I've always known myself and I've been true to my brand. Um, and, and that's why, you know, I wouldn't say the Georgetown move wasn't really strategic. You know, if, if Chris Collins would have said he didn't want me uh, on staff, you know, I could have ended up anywhere for my second job, right? Uh, I actually got an offer 10 minutes after the, uh, after the uh, announcement came out um, to another school in the Big Ten, from another school in the Big Ten to be associate head coach. And so I was blessed to, to have that. Uh, but it was a big state school. Northwestern is the only small private school. So if I would have made that move, maybe my branding would have been a little bit different. Not saying it because there's no bad schools in the Big Ten academically, but it just it's not the same as Northwestern to Georgetown, then to Georgia Tech. And so once that I made the Georgetown move, I decided that, you know, if I'm going to be a head coach, I want to keep my branding consistent. And so, you know, I was never going to work for a school that wasn't pushing the fact that they were one of the best academic schools in the country. And that's why I knew the Patriot League might be something, an opportunity the Patriot League might be my first head coaching opportunity. I've always thought that um, among some other places that I've, that I've evaluated. Um, and so I, I've stayed true to my brand. So that's two. Uh, and then I'd say the third is, is just a product of where I grew up and how I grew up. Uh, I do, I would say a strength of mine. And again, I'm tooting my own horn a little bit. Uh, but you asked the question, damn it, so I got to. Uh, I'd say a strength of mine is the ability to communicate with people from all different backgrounds. And that's a product of where I grew up and then the, the high school I went to. So I grew up, I'd say we were 80% lower income, black kids. And maybe that's high, maybe it was 70. And then there was, you know, uh, there was a farm town that bordered, we were on the southern part of our city, there's a farm town that bordered us. And so a lot of those kids came to our school as well. And so that interaction was real and authentic. Um, and then moving on through high school where, you know, it was 95%, uh, you know, upper middle class to wealthy whites, uh, being able to understand how to navigate in that environment, then going to Northwestern. And throughout that whole thing, I learned how to effectively communicate with people from all backgrounds. And uh, that's really helped me in my career. Yeah, very unique to be able to say you stuck to your um, kind of your stay true to yourself and your brand. Not very many assistants probably have thought as intentionally as you did ahead of time to kind of stay in a certain lane and know that you want to be a head coach at a place like that. So uh, definitely mad, mad props to you on, on that. And uh, I think that ability to communicate to different uh, backgrounds because of how you were uh, raised and because of your story definitely uh, helps you in recruiting, helps you in a place like you are. It's as diverse as it is, and uh, yeah, definitely uh, helps. Probably when it came to interviewing, it probably gave you a great advantage too because you had an ability to articulate to ADs, administrators, presidents as well. So, uh, uh, yeah, credit to just yeah. to speak on that real quick, it definitely yeah, helped uh, in, in terms of the interview process. So, you know, my first, I had the phone interview with the AD, uh, and then was brought was one of seven that was brought to Baltimore. Uh, to interview at the Four Seasons Hotel. <laughs> um, and we didn't know who the other candidates were, but I knew who was going to interview me. And it was uh, two sets of people. Um, the first set was my a future AD and uh, I'm trying to think of what Jeff's title was, but he's basically a businessman, uh, works for one of the uh, top investment firms in Baltimore. Um, and so I knew I was going to meet with him. So I knew that I had to be able to talk about my background in that regard. Like I was in his world um, and now I'm a coach to, to really stoke his interest in, you know, the fact that I'm versatile like that. And then the, the next set was with our VP and um, another board member who 
uh, was a former accountant. And so like knowing that stuff going into interviews is very important not to, not to, to, you know, fake it or, or try to, you know, be something that you're not, but in terms of, you know, understanding how to tell your story in a way that they'll get and they'll understand uh, and they'll appreciate and it'll separate you. Like it really made a difference for me. Um, and again, it wasn't fake. I just had to tell a couple more Wall Street stories than I normally would than if it would have been the football coach or somebody else that was in the, in the room. Um, you just got to know that and you got to be able to communicate to your audience, uh, but still be true to who you are. Yep, yep. Very similar to recruiting, which makes sense why you've had so much success. I love that goal of being the best, having the best recruiting class every year in that league. I think that's big time. And eventually, you know, that puts you in a position where you can have a chance to uh, compete to win the league and go to the tournament. So um, just kind of last question just on Loyola. Give us uh, one thing that you love about what you guys do in each of these four categories. Uh, offensively, what's one thing you love? Defensively, what's one thing you love? In recruiting, what's one thing you love? And then in your culture. Okay. Uh, so offensively, again, you know, just being honest with you all, that's my baby. Uh, even though I tried to front like I was defensive minded because I played for Kevin O'Neill. Uh, you know, I, I, <laughs> hey, that just means you yelled a lot. <laughs> yeah, no, so like, you know, the reason I say it's my baby, like I just, y'all know how it is. If you can't score, it's the worst. Like if you're playing and like just, you just can't score, you just feel like the world's coming to an end. Uh, what I like most about our offense, and it's, it's by design, uh, I'll, I'll be straight up, I do coach differently than, than the coach before me. Um, you know, we're very ball movement, player movement, um, you know, focused team. And so, like, I like the fact that our guys enjoy sharing the game. Um, you know, the cream rises to the top. We had a kid average 22 points. Uh, but, you know, he just was the one that can do the most. It wasn't, you know, we weren't running set plays for him every, down the, every time down the floor. Um, so I love the fact that, that, you know, we play a complete team game. Uh, before we got really injured, our synergy numbers were, were off the chart for year two. You know, we were top two in our league um, in every offensive category. We were one of the top teams in the country in terms of, uh, in ter I'm talking Ken Palm numbers, in terms of uh, assist turnover ratio uh, because of our style, because of, of how we play. Now that shifted once we lost a couple guys and uh, got a little, it, it got a little dark, but that's important to me. Again, I talk more about offense. I'll, I'll be quick on defense. <laughs> uh, defensively, I will say this, um, and it started right from the start we had a resilient, resilient group. Um, and so like, you know, early on you're, you're in year one of your job and, you know, you're getting your head beat in. I remember our first conference game, we were getting our head beat in. Even our first home game, actually, yeah, we played Dartmouth in our first home game. And I think, I want to say we were down either 16 nothing or maybe even 20 nothing uh, in my first home opener. I felt like shit, uh, and, but our guys came roaring back. Um, and so like, they play hard, you know, they just gotta be more disciplined um, you know, there's areas we got to attack that, but, but they do play hard and they're resilient defensively. Um, you know, the next thing you said was recruiting and then culture. Yeah. Yeah. So recruiting, you know, one thing I'll say flat out, like we don't lie to our recruits. That's important to me. We tell them exactly what it is. We tell them how it's going to be. Um, we don't promise. We don't over promise. We don't make up things. And, you know, once we get them, it's not what it's, what, what it is. And so, you know, again, I've been lucky. Uh, you know, one of my assistant coaches was a former head coach in Spain for 10 years, and he's had incredible ties over there. Uh, he's gotten us involved with some kids that could, I mean, literally play at the high major level. Um, and, and so, you know, but they also turned down pro contracts to come play here at Loyola. And it's driven by him um, and his relationship, but it also was a part of who we are, which is like his parents, they came – this is one kid in particular who started it. They came to Baltimore and this is all they know. This is all they want. They loved what they saw because we were real with them. You know, we did things we needed to do. We took them to nice restaurants and all that type of stuff, but we showed them exactly how he can be successful in everything academically, athletically, as a leader, um, and eventually back in his community, wherever that may be. Uh, we showed them all that and they, they bought into it to the point where, and I'm speaking about the one kid in particular, cause he's, He's, you know, gotten the most attention. He was MVP of the under 18 FIBA World Championships last year. And like, he's back and obviously knock on wood, you never know what's gonna happen, but 
all he talks about to his parents, I talked to his dad the other day, is just about his experiences at Loyola. And so, you know, the coaches are passionate about player development. We say that, we mean that, and we go out there and execute that. We're passionate about them being more than just basketball players. And so now that they're living that, they're starting to see that this is what's going to make them successful in life with and without the ball. And then last thing about our culture, I don't even have to say it. That's everything I just said about recruiting. That's who we are. Um, and, and, and that's what I'm most proud of is that, you know, we live that on a day-to-day -day basis. I, I sound a little bit cocky right now, um, but, I, but I am fired up about our future because of that. And it's not just that kid. We got two other ones and our domestic kids, they're all getting the same story. Now we got to get a couple of high major domestic kids, but I tell, I told the class of 22, 2022, y'all going to be the first ones to see us really be able to do what we say we can do. Everybody else been having to act on good faith. And luckily my assistant coach and his connections overseas has been able to get us some of those guys. Now we got to get some domestic guys to join them. And, and, but we know we got to show them first. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, one last recruiting question, coach, just in general, what's, what's kind of um, maybe a challenge or maybe something that's a niche for you recruiting wise that you've been able to do? I know you talked about internationally, but is there another niche that you guys kind of, kind of focus on or kind of put energy into, or is it, is it mainly inside the, the area or is it, is it the whole country that you kind of go with? Yeah. You know, you know, Loyola is not a place just being straight up where we're going to jump around the country and follow every lead. Um, what I tell my, my coaches is we got to take care of the crib first, um, you know, and, but the crib here is big time. <laughs> and so that ain't bad to put your focus and energy in the Baltimore, D.C. area because um, there's so much talent here that we got to make sure that, that we're locked in and, and that people, you know, are seeing what we're doing. But in the same breath, you know, Personally, I was, I coached in Atlanta. I coached in DC. I, I'm from Chicago and coached in Chicago. And so where there's direct relationships and obviously I've recruited all over the country at those other places where we did have the, the resources to do so. And so I got relationships in Texas, California and all that where there's real situations we will go, uh, especially if we're not getting what we need here. Um, and it's the same for my, my coaches, you know, coach Taj, who's on the call played at Stanford. Um, got West Coast ties. He's from New York, um, you know, played AU ball uh, in New York with some of the best players out. And so, like, we, we all operate under that same umbrella. We want to take care of the home, uh, but where there's players, we want to go get them. Yeah, it's the best philosophy to have, Coach. It make, makes perfect sense. Um, looking forward to watching how you guys continue to build from a player and recruiting standpoint. I uh, wanted to ask, kind of changing gears and get a little – little bit of a heavier, serious topic, but um, there's been a lot of unrest about the social injustice going on. Um, obviously, the really tragic murder of George Floyd. Um, but it's made a lot of coaches come out and a lot of companies come out. Uh, NFL, Coach K just released his statement about Black Lives Matter just the other day. Uh, just curious how you've, anything that's touched your heart as far as this goes, you've talked about being able to speak to um, kind of all demographic uh, anything you've done with your team or anything that just kind of has hit your heart heavy as far as that topic? Yeah, no, I mean, obviously the, the act itself um, is, is where you got to start. You know, why is this continuing to happen, um, continuing to happen? I mean, it's, it's not new. Um, it, it's disappointing. It's infuriating. Uh, you know, personally, you know, I look at it not so much as I know a lot of people say, uh, you know, scared for their lives and whatnot. I, I don't feel that way. Um, but I feel that, you know, the lack of understanding of why we're here and how we got here and how we, it's up to all of us, uh, not only on this call, but as a society uh, to, to make the changes and, and to acknowledge it first and foremost, acknowledge that there's systemic wrongs um, that are through no fault of ours, um, but, but it's, it's, it's destroying the fabric of who we're supposed to be as a nation. Um, and, and, and so, you know, that type of stuff is I'm passionate about. Um, you know, I'll say we talk about this type of stuff a lot, to be honest with you, before all this happened, um, you know, 
I have a, a, a team, um, one of the more diverse teams in the Patriot League. I want to say we have 10, uh, and I don't love the term people of color, but they're not all black. We got one of our, uh, sorry, they're not all African-American. I, I prefer the term black to be, or the word black versus African-American personally, but um, we have 10 and then we have seven, you know, white slash Spanish um, non-blacks. And so like we've, we, we talk about this stuff. You know, I, one thing I did during the season uh, on a road trip, we watched the movie Lincoln. Um, which is one of my favorite movies, but for college men, it's not the easiest thing to watch. They're speaking to the old English and all that type of stuff. But there were a lot of questions coming up through my phone on text message. I would have to pause it and get on the mic on the bus. And then we got to wherever we were going. I don't even remember who we were playing. Uh, but we had a real heart-to-heart -heart conversation, not just about slavery, uh, which is at the forefront of all of this, but uh, we, we talked about you know, how it's trickled down throughout our grandparents' generation, our parents, and then into today um, and you know we just try to have those real conversations and get people to understand that you know there are reasons uh, I tell them all the time as a coach like I can't coach the same way you know and that's something I just I just, I just have to know and understand like refs and, and we saw it uh, honestly probably most most uh, obvious one was in Nebraska um, when we were playing in a tournament not I don't think it was against you guys I think it was the next game um, you know where it's just like you can tell that reaction was because either, I wouldn't say it was just because I was black, but it was either because I was black or because I'm young or because I'm big. <laughs> one, of those, one of those things uh, that I have to think about when I'm getting on a rep or how I react to a certain call that another coach in my league who's older, whiter, or smaller don't have to think about. Um, and, and it's just, you know, again, I don't like, I never want anybody, I hate, because I know it happens, I hate people thinking that, you know, folks are playing the victim and all that stuff. I never let that stuff hold me back or anything. I don't think I was, you know, uh, uh, you know, not privileged and, and all that type of stuff. But I also want people to acknowledge that a lot of the systemic problems that we are because of history and because slavery existed. So I can go off on a tangent about that. I hope uh, hope somebody hope somebody got a little bit. But if anybody wants to talk further, uh, I'll put my email or phone in the chat because I can go on for days. But I will say this last thing I'll say because I know we have people of all backgrounds on this call. Like, I also am not a believer, not, shouldn't say believer, I, I'm not a fan of calling other people privileged um, either, because which, what ends up happening is you're calling somebody that's a grinder just like you and saying they're privileged. Uh, when they know they're going, they're putting their heart and soul into things. Now, do they have some uh, implicit advantages and all that type of stuff? Yeah, but, you know, we also have some too if we're good at what we do and so you know i don't want to challenge it that way but i do want everybody to accept acknowledge and understand history so we can move forward no that's that, don't good. Mean, that don't mean i believe in them damn statues I, that's not what i mean by uh accepting history that's some dumb shit sorry uh, you got your headphones on so your girl didn't hear that <laughs> coach lewis no you're good that's that's a that's an educated uh perspective coach appreciate you sharing that uh, two more questions before we get open it up for question and answer for the room. Uh, number one, what's some advice you would tell your younger self uh, now <laughs> uh, for the younger guys on the call? And then also, uh, what's the what's kind of your why and your legacy that you want to leave behind? Yeah. Um, so first piece of advice I would tell my younger self, uh, and actually it's funny they they no they're not around at the same time. So when I was. <laughs> I don't want to get into the long-winded uh, story. As y'all can tell, I tell a lot of stories. I, t I talk. I got a lot of in-depth. Uh, I, I usually get into the nitty-gritty, the details of the stories. But I'll be quick. I made a decision uh, shortly after taking the job at Northwestern, leaving Wall Street or leaving, uh, you know, Chicago's banking district, whatever you call that, um, to buy a condo. And actually, I made the decision before uh, I left, but I could have gotten out of it when I took the job at Northwestern, uh, don't ever do that. Don't, don't buy and lock yourself into a place. It was a three bedroom, it was on the lake. I was excited about it. I thought Chicago was gonna get the Olympics. That's really why I did it. Uh, it was 45 minutes from Northwestern. And then when I left the job, uh, I was stuck with the place. I couldn't sell it uh, uh, and I couldn't rent it out. I had all sorts of rules and regulations uh, on why I couldn't rent it out. So for two years, and to be honest, salary-wise, Northwestern Georgetown 
at the time was a lateral move, but DC is way more expensive and I'm paying for this condo back in Chicago. It was miserable. So don't do that. Don't lock yourself into something until you know you're going to be there a while and, uh, and, and you know that you, know, you can sell it or, or you can uh, rent it out. That's the first thing I would tell my younger self. Uh, more importantly, probably, and probably more uh, you know, substance behind it is I, I didn't, if I have one regret, and I didn't handle the uh, exit from Northwestern the best way. I don't regret leaving. I can't help the way it went down in that an opportunity presented itself after I had committed to staying because, you know, it was a lot. It was a challenging year for me. Um, my mother passed away that year. First time I'd ever lost like that and gotten fired. And, like, I didn't technically get fired because I was under a multi-year contract, but uh, first time any of that had ever happened. Um, and so when it came time for the Georgetown deal, like, I made a unilateral decision, meaning I have a board of directors that I always run everything by. But I didn't talk to anybody about it, including some people at Northwestern who had been great for me um, and, and guiding me through my career. And I know it left, left a bad taste in their mouth. And I would say that's probably my, my biggest regret is not that I left. Um, and, and me and Chris Collins have always been cool. He understood it. Um, you know, I helped there in a time when grad transferring was just getting popping. They had a kid that could have gone anywhere in the country, Drew Crawford. Um, and I convinced him to stay before I left, which was meaningful. and, and, and and I, it was the right thing for him. He could have gone anywhere. He was averaging, you know, 20 a game the year before. Um, but I felt good about that. But it was time for me to move on. But I didn't do it the exact right way, and I wish I could do that differently. Yeah, uh, right, right. And then did you, did you already touch on legacy, Coach? No, I mean, I think I touched on it just when you hear me talk about, you know, our mission and our culture. Um, and, again, if, if we get to a PowerPoint, um, you know, you'll see that that's, that's embedded in what we do. And as Coach Taj and uh, Coach Farrell, who's online, can tell you, like, it's not fake with us. So I think I've already uh, said that. But, you know, I want to I wanna send every year three to four exceptional young leaders out into the world and, and have them affect positive change on their communities, uh, wherever that may be. And some of them are going to go play professional basketball. A lot of former players that are still playing right now uh, from Northwestern, from Georgetown, from Georgia Tech. Uh, and, and, you know, we want to do that. We got a kid uh, from Loyola just texting me today that uh, he may have gotten his offer, a senior who just graduated. And so the basketball is great, but we also have a lot of great guys doing other things. Um, and, and that's what we want. Uh, quick, quick, quick shout out. Uh, the kid, not a kid, the man uh, that got arrested, the CNN anchor, Omar Jimenez, uh, you know, is one of my former players. We were texting uh, the night before. Uh, he got arrested on national television for what went down. And, you know, we have those types of people all throughout the country. Uh, and, and that's what, that's what, that's what I feel like um, is important for what I do uh, as a college basketball coach. Uh, that's awesome. Big time stuff, coach. Big time for sure. Uh, if we can get, I don't know if he's available. He may be available, may not be. We got Ben Johnson, former teammate on the line. We're going to give him a couple of minutes to, to say a couple of words about coach. If, if he's not busy, if he's tied up, we'll just open up to the room. And uh, go ahead and go ahead and have questions. So he may he may be a little tied up, but don't he was going to text you back. So go ahead. Uh, this is Sam, obviously. Hey, um, you mentioned like your high school and AU coaches and and the fundamental kind of work you got with them. I mean, I remember your high school coach coming to our high school practice and like teaching us four corner shell, and I was just like, I never seen this in my life. You know, like, so obviously now that's something we all do from a defensive standpoint, but like, I guess being a college coach and head coach now, like, how do you find the balance between we need to work on fundamentals, but we also need to work on a lot of other stuff. And you can't, you can't do it all, obviously. I mean, I'm at a small division too, and we have a certain amount of time for practice. You know, and I want to work on fundamentals so much, but you just don't have time to do that all the time, you know? Right. Yeah, no, I, I definitely understand. I mean, we try through the recruiting process to identify self-motivated workers um, and, and we encourage them. We give them access to the gym. Um, I do have great coaches who love being in the gym with them, um, even if I'm not in there myself. Um, and, and so that's important. But I know, you know, the higher up you get in terms of levels, the more money you got to spend on staff uh, and and 
you know, I know that that's not the same for, for everywhere. Um, you know, but yeah, I think, you know, the recruiting process is so key to their development, but uh, we rope it into our practices. We rope it into, um, you know, our, our strategies throughout the week because uh, we know the value of it. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there's so much to do. We feel so we put so much work into the offseason to fix our defense. So now we got to spend time on it. <laughs> and, and Coach Taj can he'll probably tell you that we didn't do enough. We didn't spend enough time on it. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, like I said, I want to score. And so I got to I got to spend time on that. And so, um, you know, it's just about being organized and balanced and um, going into it with uh, with a game plan and then sticking to it and executing it. Great question, Coach. Great question. What's going on, Coach? This is Julian. Uh, question for you. Um, so each transition that you had to make, um, how was it those conversations with your wife and your kids about transitioning to the next state or the next school? Because I know they're getting old, and I'm sure they're building friends at each place that they go. So how, how are those conversations when you got to tell them that you got a new job? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, it, it's, it's never easy. Uh, my wife has been cool. Uh, primarily, I think it helps that she was a hooper. Um, and she was involved in the decision before I took this job. Um, you know, she, it wasn't like, yo, I'm about to be a college coach. Uh, come on board. Like, you know, we had to talk out the details of what does this mean? Because um, she knew that, you know, what she knew of me and what she knew of the business, it was going to be a grind. Um, my daughter, my oldest is getting harder and harder each time. Um, you know, I, I think I take comfort in, we don't, we haven't been chasing anything. We haven't been moving for the wrong reasons. Uh, each move was strategic. Um, to be quite honest, you know, my wife, you know, <laughs> we moved to DC, she gets pregnant. Uh, then we moved to Atlanta, she gets pregnant. And so like, she, she had a hard time in DC. Um, in terms of finding she not only was she pregnant, but she also had two young girls. And so trying to find her um, sort of self uh, desires and passions, uh, it wasn't easy. Uh, but when she got to Atlanta, she was able to find all that. And our girls were going to school with uh, and, uh, other girls their age, and their parents were around our age, and it, it got better there. And so that was challenging for her to move from uh, Atlanta to Baltimore because she was starting to get into her groove. But she knew that this was a part of our journey. And so again, I think I want to say, uh, Brian may have asked this in a question or at least, you know, put it, put, was going to ask it in a question, but uh, I immersed my family into, into the job. Um, they come to all our games, they go to all our women's games, they go to all our women's volleyball games, we go to soccer, lacrosse games, uh, and just, I want them to bleed the Loyola green um, so that they understand that when daddy's got to watch this film, um, he's doing it to help our team win that they, they love and support. Good question, Julian. We'll take a couple more before Coach uh, gets some some breakdown for us. Uh, Where? Is, oh, go ahead. Uh, I coach on the women's staff at Loyola, so Tavares is like right down right down the 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 hallway from me. But this is really just a shout out um, to Tavares um, and his staff. You know, many times when I've been in this business nineteen years, and you don't always know when a new staff comes in how the women's and men's staff are going to get along. And that's always um, something that I always get asked, well, hey, how, how are you guys tight with the men's staff? And there's a shout out that, you know, Tavares is the real deal. I know Tavares, you got a lot of friends on this little Zoom here, but he's the real deal. And everything he's saying, man, I just – I call him my guy, you know, I go to him for, for advice, but he gives it right back to me. Uh, he gives me a hard time and, and I got you big fella. I got you big fella. Um, but just really you shout out. I gave you a hard time from this. We're all family. <laughs> that's right. That's right. But just a shout out to Tavares and his staff. They just, uh, they're just really, really good people and just really excited for what he's building a program, uh, just not a team, but a program. And so I just wanted to give that shout out to, Give love back to the the guys on, on the on the men's staff. That was Thank awesome. you, Shelly. Yeah, that was awesome, Coach. <laughs> T, T, I was going to ask. Obviously, this is maybe a little bit narrow focused, but uh, being a Princeton guy myself, um, having played for Carmody, coached with him, uh, 
you know, obviously worked at Georgetown. What are things that you're doing now with the offense, like with the Princeton offense and how you're using all the years of playing it, coaching it, um, and then, but kind of fitting it to what you want to do now as a head coach? Yeah. No, um, you know, it's funny because at, at each move, especially after I left Northwestern and in Georgetown, we ran it. Um, and at Northwestern, we had ran it so effectively. I'd say, you know, got to give a shout out first to our former coach, Bill Carmody, um, and even Pete Carrill, because they were ahead of the game. They saw the game and the way they taught us how to play. And this isn't being cocky. This is being real. And I can prove it to you all. They saw the game. They saw the future of the game before everybody else could see it. And so the spacing, the ball movement, the player movement that we were being taught is, has, has become very uh, prevalent in the game today uh, across the board. And so by the back stretch of our time at Northwestern, People don't even realize everybody thought Princeton offense slow down, slow down. They beat UCLA 43, 41. That's what they think of it. Uh, you know, we were scoring at will in the big 10. Now, yeah, when we're playing Jared Sullinger and them, and we know it would be stupid to try to beat them in the foot race, you know, or Michigan state Draymond green, we beat those teams because we can, we can adjust our pace. Um, but we also led the big 10 in scoring. People didn't realize that. And so then when I get to Georgetown, you know, I didn't realize it was, they were more old school than us. Uh, they just had better players. Uh, they had pros. And so like where we would cut back door, AJ, you probably remember somebody throw a, a bad pass. You're falling out of bounds, reaching out, trying to get it. And you throw up a hope layup and spin it and it rolls off the backboard. Georgetown dudes would, would grab that and then vertically go up and dunk it backwards. <laughs> and so like being able to see that and coach that at that level, really showed me what it can expand to and what it can grow with. Um, then getting to Georgia Tech, and I got to give a shout out to, to, to Hayden on board, uh, who, who I work with at Georgia Tech. Uh, Georgia Tech. But uh, Coach Passner, you know, to his credit, uh, gave me a lot of autonomy in terms of putting in our offense. And so being able to see how it can translate to the ACC. Um, and, and, you know, we are more of a defensive team, to be honest. Uh, defense won us our games. The reason we went to the championship of the NIT year one, when we were projected to not win a game in the ACC. Uh, it was because of our defense. That was a bread and butter. But we won those games down the stretch because the guys got more comfortable with our offense. So long-winded way of saying, you watch the Spurs, you watch the Nuggets, you watch Golden State. Golden State's running low post play, AJ. They're, they're split screening. They're doing all the things that we were taught when we were players. Denver Nuggets is running – point screen away they're running point over the top the Boston Celtics like they're running so much of what we did and so now it's it's easier to sell because I can pull up a film right now of Andrew Kosteka who was our best player last year hitting the pinch post screening away popping out banging a three and then I can pull out a clip of Will Barton doing it <laughs> from the Denver Nuggets uh, or, or Clay Thompson doing it and we can show that to recruits um, and really helps drive our story. We can show it to our players and help drive their belief in what we're doing. And so, you know, that, that's been the fun part. Um, and again, it's not everybody. I can't show anything from the Houston Rockets. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I, we, don't, we don't have any of that going on where one guy's making all the decisions and everybody's standing around watching. That's not our game. But I also, I didn't like to play that way. And I would have a hard time coaching that way. But if y'all got a heart and I take them, we just try to, try to, try to you know, teach them to move without the ball sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Charlie, I got a question for you. Justin from uh, Dartmouth College here. Um, first thing is, can you talk a little bit about your, your practice structure? I know you're very offensive minded. And is it, does that mean 90 10 offense, defense? Does that mean, you know, 70 30? A little bit about that. And then the second question is, how have you developed? the Princeton offense? How have you put your own wrinkles? Have you done anything transition wise? And maybe you talk about that, you know, with your presentation, but you know, what are your philosophies for transition or how, any wrinkles that you, you added to the, to the Princeton offense? Great questions, man. Great questions, Jay. I'll go with that one first. Cause AJ also kind of answered to ask something similar. And I didn't really get to that part. I kind of went off on a tangent, but I think the other stuff was helpful too, AJ. I hope. Uh, but just in terms of uh, expansion of the Princeton offense, 
Um, you know, what we say is this. We say, and now I'm getting into a little bit more of the basketball piece. Uh, you know, first things first, we want to attack in transition. Um, and so what does that mean? Everybody says they want to play fast. Uh, you know, that's how we got to recruit. We got to tell everybody. But nobody's playing like the running rebels back in our day. <laughs> like nobody's just helter skelter, right? And so what we say is with our transition attack, first and foremost, in our film sessions, we celebrate our defensive stops. That's the key to our offense is playing good defense, right? And so if we can get a turnover, our first year we led the league in turnovers by far, right, in steals. And so we scored a lot of just flat out take the ball from some guys and, and break away dunk. Uh, and so great, who's going to turn that down? We all want to do that, right? But we also, in year two, we said – that may have cost us in some cases. So we weren't going to go crazy shooting every gap um, when we're giving up layups by, by going for every steal. That wasn't going to define our game. But what other ways can you generate points off defense besides just steals? And so we talk a lot about uh, what we say, you know, if someone takes a bad shot, all right? So, yeah, we want to punish them on turnovers, but we also want to punish them on bad shots. Because usually when a bad shot happens, you know, your teammates pissed off because you looked him off. You know, you feel a little bad, so you put your head down. And so, like, if we can get teams to take contested shots, we are very aggressive in pushing the ball after that, if that makes sense. Uh, and, and so uh, that's not it. It's not it. You know, we also – we try to punish teams who celebrate. And so made baskets, we get it out quick. Um, if it's a miss, bad shot, or steal, we don't care who pushes it. Made basket, we have a, a designated guy taking it out, a designated lead guard that gets the outlet. But we, we run. Our wings are out and going. Uh, get to the deep corner if there's an open post. Obviously, if it's a made basket, our big is running there. If it's, if it's not a made basket, we don't care who runs there. But we want to put pressure on the rim. We want to shoot rhythm threes. We don't want to shoot like everybody. This ain't saying nothing. You guys don't know. We don't want to shoot contested twos. But we want to be aggressive for rhythm threes. We want to be aggressive for, for layups. What I hate probably – and I emphasize it more than a lot of people is I don't like hope layups. And so if you, if you got to get into the paint and you got to do, you know, all this to be able to get it off in transition, that's not a good shot for me. Uh, I don't like it. I'd rather flow and execute into our stuff. And that's the next piece. Uh, Again, this is probably long winded, but this is probably what I'm most passionate about uh, how we flow into our offense. So we got your normal drags, but we flow into the Princeton offense uh, very quickly and so if we don't have anything on the attack, how we get to our low post or our pinch is very quick. And then we just start, like we, we call it attacking in the half court too. We just start moving and you know, the ball's hopping, we're screening and we're cutting and, and we're just going, going nuts from there. Appreciate that, thank you. Yeah. Um, He's gonna yeah. try to use that against you, Coach, now that he knows that. No, no, it's cool. I mean, what I like most about the Princeton offense uh, or, you know, again, it's named the Princeton offense and, you know, some people call it structured motion. Um, some people call it read, react. Uh, but what I like most of it, most about it is, you know, the guys are making most of the decisions. They're structured to it, uh, but the guys are making most of the decisions. They have a choice. Do I go this way, that way, or this way? And nobody knows. We don't tell them. They decide that for themselves. That stuff has not changed. Uh, some of the, some of the, you know, uh, if this then that has changed, meaning if I go this way, what I do versus what JT3 did versus what Carmody did, some of that has changed. But giving the guys the choice has not changed. And uh, that's what's fun to, the, to that's, that's why it's fun to coach. And it can be dangerous. The better players you get, the more they can do a lot of different things, the harder you are to guard. And that's what we want to get to. What was the first part of your question? Uh, the first part was just a practice structure. So with that, you know, how much time it takes to learn the Princeton and, you know, you seem to be very offensive minded, just, just how much, what's the breakdown? Is it 70, 30? Is it 90, 10? Is it... Yeah. And so. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We should, we should probably let coach, coach, uh, coach Taj answer the question, right? <laughs> See, coach Taj, you know, <laughs> coach Taj wasn't with us year we'll, one. We'll let, we'll let him, we'll let him answer first. Then we'll let coach answer. <laughs> yeah. I got. I'll I'll give year one, and then I'll give a brief year two, and let Taj tell you if I'm lying or not. I would honestly say that it's probably we 
we earlier on the season we focused more on defensive drills and then i mean like most programs i think as the season goes on you start playing more five on five um but i think it's probably 60 40 um offense okay which is way better than what it was the year before as coach Farrell <laughs> can probably tell you uh where you know i started you know when i first got the gig i had the spring workouts I had the summer workouts and you know, to be honest, one of the best things for me my first year was that two months I spent with Chris Collins um, and, and seeing how he, what he prioritized first. And, he, and then spending, you know, being at the first two years with, with Josh Pastner, um, you know, when I got to Northwestern, Carmen had already been there six years. JT3 had already been at Georgetown forever. Uh, but then being able to be up at the ground level and how they structured things was important to me. But then once, to, to Todd's point, it happened sooner than, year one and year two, but eventually you get to a point where you're like, damn, man, you know, we got to, we got to score. <laughs> we got we to gotta put the ball in the hole. Uh, and, and, and so that 60, 40 year two was probably uh, 60, 40 to start of year one. And by the end of year one, it was, uh, you know, you got about five minutes to do the scouting and we're moving on. <laughs> Thanks again. Ours, uh, Adam Hood, UTSA. Uh, I just had a question. Uh, again, obviously, this business is highly competitive. Uh, there's a lot, you know, a lot of people that want jobs. What, what are two or three things that made you so desirable? You know what I mean? Like, again, you're desirable. You're, again, you're a minority head coach. It's like, we're, whatever you got on the escalator, you got to let us know, man. You got to get us behind the curtain. But what was it? What do you feel like allowed you to be so desirable? You get fired and then you got a job from the Big Ten right away. You know what I mean? Like, a lot of people, it's struggleville, you know, but with you, seemed like you were just kind of like the chosen, not the chosen one, but you know what I mean? Like yeah. the, the struggles just didn't bind you. No, you, I remember. You know, that, that kind of you think helped set you apart and make you so desirable or so valued in this coaching profession. Yeah, I remember the first time I talked to rising coaches in Vegas and I was like, man, I don't know if I want to do this because my shit different than everybody else's. Uh, and, and, <laughs> and I don't mean that in a negative way. Like I almost, I almost feel it negative towards me. Cause like y'all probably looking at me like this dude is privileged. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, he no, go, not, he not, not to, that. He ain't have to go through what we went through. Like he ain't grind. He ain't, he ain't, you know. I, I'll, 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 I'll say, I'll say this part before he finishes the story though. I think part of it, he was a really good player in the league, but he handled himself so well as a player. I think some of that translated to his reputation, his brand, like he talked about, uh, and he's at the highest level. So, the respect of those coaches at the highest level gives him, uh, if you want to call it a privilege, it gives him a, a different way in than maybe even a guy like myself or yourself or maybe other people on the call. So to credit to him, because if he wasn't who he was as a player and carrying himself the right way and handling his business, I think he doesn't even have that same entryway. But then after that, the entryway, being at a Northwestern, like he talked about with the high academic, and then just – having success at a place that's really hard to have success at as a coach and, and in recruiting to have success. And I think there was so much respect, uh, again, from a friend and family member watching it. It's like people respect what he's doing because that's Northwestern. Like that doesn't happen over there when he played and when he coached. So I can say that too. And Adam, I'll be straight up. Like there's always luck in this business, right? There's luck in every business. There's luck in life. Um, and Part of my luck, I, was, I say Bill Carmody, one of the first things he said to me was, I'm never going to put you in a bubble, you know, to what Brian was saying earlier, the, the, always the worry is you're going to be asked to just be a recruiter um, and, and not allowed to coach. And he told me that right away, that that's not what this is going to be. If that's what you want to do, uh, just be a recruiter. This isn't the industry for you. Uh, now go help me get players. <laughs> now, now, now go recruit. Um, was sort of the conversation. But as and I had to like he was that wasn't his thing. He hated. I shouldn't say hate. That's that's not the right word because he was incredible when he when he wanted to do it. Um, you know, I, I took him to Atlanta, Mr. Basketball, Jershon Cobb. Uh, you know, and, and we're battling some ACC schools and. I had to beg him to come down there and do the home interview with us because that just wasn't his thing, um, which was great for me because I got a chance to do all of them. 
I got a chance to do all the home visits by myself. And so I was getting that experience and exposure early, but you know, just to shout out Bill Carmody, when he came down, cause I was like, coach, I can't do this one by myself. Like you gotta put your weight in here. He was phenomenal. He was, he was incredible. I was mad. I was like, dude, if you did this all the time, we probably would have got Jabari Parker or somebody. <laughs> but anyway, that's another story. But uh, uh, the fact that he, he gave me those responsibilities uh, and, and the coaches in the league knew, knew him. They knew that he was an introvert. They knew that uh, he was a brilliant basketball mind. And so they knew I was learning from him, but they also knew that I was, I was having to do some things that a lot of assistant coaches didn't have to do um, because, you know, of his personality in some ways. And I, I, I was lucky that the only reason I got the job was because Craig was leaving and, you know, coach didn't know that many people that he wanted to even mess with like that. You know what I'm saying? That's the only reason I'm here is because he didn't know that many people. And, and I can say this, you know, he wasn't going to have an all white staff. So he damn sure didn't know that many black people that he wanted to mess with like that. And so that's why when he, I probably, when, when I made that joke, it probably like took, took some pressure off him that he didn't have to, he didn't have to go, you know, trying to find something. It is what he was an introvert. He wasn't out there like that. Um, and that helped me. That really helped me sort of build that brand um, that it was authentic. It was, it was real work that I was putting in uh, because I was lucky enough to work for Bill Carmody. That's awesome. Uh, coach Carter, I got a question, man. I was just going to ask you, you know, just being a black coach, have you ever got like some type of crazy stares or some type of uh, crazy discrimination against you? Because I, I always think of when John Thompson, you guys was at Georgetown, like, man, how, how is Georgetown running a Princeton offense when his dad was – hardcore, busting the mouth type of street kind of a coach. You know yeah. what I mean? And how that always kind of translated. So if you yeah. experience something like that, if you don't mind sharing that. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I've been lucky again in the sense that, um, you know, probably early on in my career, I was oblivious, not oblivious to racial issues, but I had sort of that, I can recruit anybody. I remember, <laughs> I remember jumping on a, a puddle jumper uh, in Illinois, like, you know, Illinois is, is Chicago and then outside of Chicago, the rest of the state is like Iowa. No offense, AJ. <laughs> um, and, and so, like, I remember jumping on a puddle jumper to get to the southern Illinois and going to this town where, you know, you know, uh, I'm not going to say anything to get me fired, but who knows what was going on down there uh, and trying to recruit this big seven footer, um, you know, dealing with his mom and she was great. I mean, it's, you know, great, great family. Um, but like, I felt just as comfortable down there based on where I grew up uh, and the experiences I had uh, with the kids from across the, across the, 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 the border, uh, you know, our, our town border. Uh, and, and so like, I never feared those situations. All my family's from Mississippi. I'm the only one of, of my, my brothers, sisters, mother, father that wasn't born in Mississippi. So I spent my time in the South and, you know, I learned how to navigate, navigate those waters. Um, but I will say this, you know, in terms of coaching, you know, one thing, <laughs> you know, I can say this now, I wouldn't say it if he was an active coach, but John Thompson III used to always say, sometimes we get worse treatment from the brothers in terms of officiating. Um, you know, we get, we get worse treatment uh, because they're trying to go out of their way to show they're not showing favoritism. Uh, so, so sometimes that happens. And then in other cases, I'd say in terms of recruiting, you know, we get, we, I get with a group of uh, uh, first time black head coaches uh, on Sunday evenings. Um, and, and we talk about all sorts of different issues. One thing we talk about straight up is that from a recruiting standpoint, because of society, sometimes black kids don't hear us the same way uh, they hear white coaches, um, just because of the way society always has been. And so like, who do you look at as being, you know, better in some cases? Uh, and it, it sometimes it's the parents. It, it, it just happens. Now, sometimes, you know, they do hear us the same way uh, or, or they do hear us a certain way. But we talk about all the time how, you know, we have to be, you know, we have to be very, we're, we're a lot of us. And, and again, this is probably too much stereotyping than I like to do. But we say we, we keep it real. We tell players the truth. And being straight up, some, uh, some white coaches don't. And some black coaches probably don't too. Uh, we, we're not all the same. And a lot of white coaches tell the truth too. Like, I'm not saying that, but I know there's a lot of cases where we lost recruiting battles when I was at Georgetown. Uh, the coaches that I wouldn't, I wouldn't let my son go play for. I wouldn't let my daughter go play for. Um, and, and 
you know, I know I would let my son or daughter go play for John Thompson III, and that's frustrating sometimes when you see that happen. You're muted, Brian. Uh, I'm still on mute. Sorry about that. Great questions from everybody. Uh, we got about 20, 30 minutes or so, Coach. If you want to do a little presentation, feel free. If you want to just keep going questions, it's totally your call. Yeah, I mean, I, I can give you guys a quick PowerPoint. I'm, I'm hesitant on the video stuff just because I know it'd be choppy, um, and I don't like that. I, don't, I, I can't. Let's just do the PowerPoint, Coach. That's good. Um, but we, I also we, don't. We, we, we know you can coach. You don't have to show us the video. Yeah, yeah. I mean, y'all get on synergy. You can you can figure that that stuff out. If you have any questions, ask me. Um, uh, in terms of the PowerPoint, I, I touched on most of the stuff, and so I don't have also don't have a problem continuing to just go on Q and A. But I can give you guys just a little bit of sort of how I structured the program. Um, am I allowed to share my screen? Yeah, yeah just hit that button. Yep, should be good. Let me know if you have any trouble. I did go to Northwestern. <laughs> did you go awesome. to any chaos parties at Northwestern, Coach? Oh, man. I <laughs> loved it. And so just a little bit, I mean, to answer that question, yeah, uh, I love chaos. That was one of my favorite times of the year. Uh, I think I went up when I was a senior in high school, my first experience. That's chaos was a, I think the Kappas put it on or the Alphas, one of them. Uh, but I wasn't there for the Alphas or the Kappas. I was there for the AKAs as a senior, not as a, not later on because I had my girlfriend, but uh, I love chaos. <laughs> senior in high school. So this is one thing I'll say. Hopefully you guys can all see it and hear me. Um, when I was going after the job at Loyola, uh, a big part of, you know, I'd say why I got it um, was because, I, like I said earlier, I knew what it was. Um, and so this is, I studied uh, the Loyola mission statement. And, and what I found was so much of my thoughts, so much of what I believe in directly aligned with this. And so, you know, this is on the main page. We, we, we use a compass. Later, I'll show you my shirt. I don't know if you guys can see me anywhere. I can't see myself. But uh, this compass, like, it's a part of Loyola, and we've used that as a part of our culture, as a part of our program. I've always believed in process um, over the direct results. And so when I read this for Loyola, talking about explorers beginning a journey to identify a goal, like, the journey really hit home. And so uh, our program mantra, which you'll see later, Embrace the Journey, was directly in, in line with what the, the university was all about. Uh, and so much of this quote uh, really translates not only to the religious aspect of Loyola, to the, the guiding principles of a higher uh, institute of higher education, but also to what you would want in a basketball program. Um, and and I, I'll read this out loud because you know, it really hits with me. They carry with them the knowledge, provisions, and a pledge to collaborate and support one another along the way. Like, that's the, that's the way we play. Brian asked me to describe my offense. We got to collaborate and support each other. We're a team-oriented game, a team-oriented style of play. They also use a compass to guide them and keep them focused on their path to their destination. That's why we're so intentional with our blueprint. Um, you know, we want to know the plan. We want to use it. Uh, we want to be able to lean on it when we hit tough situations. Because their travels are full of unknowns, they take each step with purpose and conviction while remaining open to the possibilities the adventure presents. Like, again, we talk about this type of stuff all the time. We're, we're, we're on a journey. It's an adventure. It's fun. And it's going to prepare our guys to be future leaders in society. This was my first quote. What excites me most about Loyola University is the opportunity to fully integrate the core principles of the Ignatian way into building a highly successful men's basketball program. Like to me, that wasn't hard to come off the, off my lips. Like when I said that, you know, that was real. I didn't have to make that up. I didn't have to think about it. Um, you know, in studying, in studying our, our mission statement, it was real. Uh, we are here to serve. Like we're, as coaches, you'll see we serve our student athletes. Our student athletes will go on and serve their greater communities. Uh, our success will be defined on that, by that. 
Our mission is very simple inspire and empower our student athletes to be great academically, athletically, in the community, and as leaders. And in our vision, and this is where the meat and potatoes are of our operation, we want to provide an unparalleled student athlete experience uh, and, and all the different things that go into that. We don't sugarcoat. So this is how we define those four categories, which is if you look, uh, if you see our compass that we keep, uh, and it's our program symbol. Uh, we always put athletic success on the north side because that's at the top and we know that all our players want to be pros and they want to win championships. And, and, and for us to deny that and lie about that um, being their ultimate goal would, would be us not being true to, to ourselves or to true to them. Uh, but, but it's not just about that. This is the other stuff that, you know, we want to make sure that we're stressing and, you know, they're all equally important um, in terms of our attention to detail in the areas. So these are our core values. And obviously it's a little corny in terms of using the word great. We talk about being loyal or great, um, but these are, are, are trained and they're taught. Um, if we can recruit them, great, we wanna do that. But definitely these are constantly emphasized throughout our program. We're gonna grind. We gotta be one of the hardest working, if not the hardest working teams. I never say we're the hardest workers because we don't know what everybody else is doing, but we better be up there in the top and our work will prove that. The responsible piece is so critical because I don't like pointing fingers. I don't like blaming. I don't like, you know, any type, type of situation where, you know, we're telling our, our, our administration that, you know, we would have been good, but this is what happened. Like, we got we to gotta be responsible for our own actions, control the things we can control and go about our business the right way. Enthusiastic, e equally important. You can't be successful in these things if you're not excited about them. If you don't come to practice with energy and enthusiasm, you, you're not going to have a great practice. If you don't care about the things you're learning in class, you're not going to learn anything. Um, the appreciative piece, as we all know, uh, you, you, you have to be humble. Um, you have to be able to be grateful and show gratitude. That's very important to our program. And then the last one, tenacious. Um, you know, again, that word could have been toughness. It could have been teamwork. It could have been all of these different things. But what I like about tenacious is, it forces our guys to dream big and go after those dreams. So I want them to say, we want to be pros, all right? Then what are you going to do about it? You know what I'm saying? Like, once you say that, what are you going to do about it? Um, I want them to, am I frozen? Okay, so y'all was being real still. I was looking at y'all. <laughs> uh, I, I, I want them to, to talk about, you know, not so much about winning championships, but I don't mind if they do uh, because, that's you gotta you gotta you gotta be able to say those things, but then you gotta be able to put the work in to to make it happen. You gotta go after those goals, and so you know that's why we use the word tenacious a lot in terms of our approach. Um, we're attacking the things that we're dreaming about. So I said the the core values were ones we 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 train and we teach. The first four in this we call them non negotiable values. And again, you know, I was lucky enough to inherit most of our guys had these already, but in terms of recruiting, if you don't have these four things, we don't mess with you. And I tell my staff, and it's the same thing in terms of putting together a staff. If you don't have these four qualities, it's non-negotiable. You can't be a part of our program. Uh, and so we, we had to deal with a little bit, uh, one or two guys that didn't have it when we inherited them. You know, I'm not a run a guy off type, type person. We tried to mold them over to, to, to doing what, what, what we needed them to do. Uh, but these are things that, that are important. You have to have integrity. You have to be passionate about all these things that are important to us. You have to be a team player. It can't be about yourself. It can't be about, you know, I, 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 I. We have to be about the group. Uh, and then you have to have a commitment, a commitment to excellence, a commitment to being the best that you can be, a commitment to being great. Um, Charles, real quick, you're doing a fabulous job, man. This is this is a high level breakdown in, in PowerPoint. Did you use this on your interview, or is this something you did after you became head coach? So some of these things, um, I'll, I'll say, you know, I used on the interview, but not like that beginning stuff was. That was that was the the press conference. Um, you know, that was after I already had the job. Like it was it was me feeling really good about. Uh, all right, I got this job that I've, I've, I've recently learned so much about. Um, but some of this stuff, uh, I would say 
I, I, straight up, like the, the great, the Loyola great, you know, that came over time. That wasn't, I didn't have that in my book, uh, you know, going into the gig or anything like that. That was something I built, um, you know, and, and those core values. I, I really wanted to put a lot of thought into like, all right, what's important? What has made, helped me become successful throughout as a student athlete, as a player? What have helped the players I've been able to coach be successful? And those core values are, 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 are what resonated with me. And that's why, that's why we put that there. No. And awesome. then these, these, these non-negotiables was, was similar. Like some things I just can't deal with. I can't, I have a really hard time dealing with selfish people. Uh, and so that's, that's in my non-negotiables. You have to be a team, team oriented guy. Um, and again, there's going to be some selfishness uh, just in the nature of you, you want to be good, but you have to be good as a part of the greater, the greater good and, the, and being a part of something bigger than yourselves, which we all know is a new cliche thing now. And so as Taj and, and Kevin can tell you guys, you know, and this is also something that I learned throughout uh, being at Loyola, uh, it's an Ignatian Jesuit principle. Uh, they call it the examine. Uh, I'm very big on self-evaluation. Um, in some ways I'm hard, I'm, too, I'm, I'm really hard on myself, uh, but I think you have to be. Uh, to be successful in this business. I don't think you, you can't sit around and think you're the greatest thing that ever happened to, to the world. And again, I know I'm sitting here talking, telling you guys all these nuggets and stuff, and it probably sounds a little cocky because that's the nature of doing one of these Zooms. Um, I have to check because uh, I do have another one after this, <laughs> a little more recruiting focus. Um, but anyway, I was saying, you know, you, you have to talk a little bit about yourself, but I don't view that as selfish, but like your, your intent you know, it's got to be, I want to be uh, the best assistant coach in the country, but I want to do that because I want this team to be the best team in the country. Um, and I want to work with other great assistants to become that. And, you know, you got to be humble in those situations. So the last piece, so as I was talking about self-evaluation, because I kind of went off on a tangent there, uh, this balanced scorecard. And so uh, this is a, a, a unique story, um, you know, there's actually two sort of interviews out there um, that I did with Daniel Parker. Uh, one was a mock interview. It was just me and him, a uh, search firm guy from Parker Executive Search, uh, not a search firm guy. He's uh, one of the best <laughs> and most powerful search firms, uh, executives in our business. Uh, but we did a mock interview. Um, and, and so that's out there. Some, some nuggets on if you guys are getting deeper into the process, you should watch. And then there's uh, the one afterwards, the anatomy of a coaching search, which is Daniel Parker, myself, and our, our athletic director, Donna Woodruff, who I'm so grateful for that she gave me this opportunity. Uh, but a quick story I tell in that is, um, you know, I, I, I had gotten wind that there were some of my competitors at the Four season who had, you know, recently come off some big time success. And so, you know, I'm trying to figure out how I can jockey myself in position. I know they want the job. I want the job. How do I combat that? You know, we were coming off a rough season. Um, and, and so how do I combat that? And one way I think helped me was this, what I call balanced scorecard. I was able to articulate that, you know, our program won't be evaluated, won't be defined just by our win loss record. Now we know that's important. We know that's, that's critical. You know, ADs want to win, presidents want to win, fans want to win. And so we got to do everything we can to win. Uh, but also what else is there about your program and where can I be better than those guys in, for Loyola. Um, and so that's why I came up with the balanced scorecard. These are the four ways that we self-evaluate as a staff. Um, and I self-evaluate myself, sound like Dr. Evil <laughs> or Austin, Austin Powers. Um, but the student athlete experience is number one. And, and we, 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 we really dig into that, making sure we're holding ourselves true to providing those guys the unparalleled student athlete experience. Um, efficient operations. I'd say, you know, if I had to look back to you know, my first couple of years, this is an area that's, that's not been as, as best, um, you know, because you're trying to put the best offense in, the best defense. You're trying to, uh, you know, make sure you're doing everything with your staff and all that stuff. And, you know, some stuff gets kicked down the line, like doing my damn receipts from a recruiting trip. <laughs> um, you know, I don't have a secretary or administrative assistant. Um, my ops guy helps me out when I can get them, this, when I can get them the stuff. Uh, but sometimes that stuff just get kicked down the road left and right. Uh, and, and so like that's one area that, you know, as we get 
we have we spend less time i spend less time worrying about certain things i can spend more time making sure our efficient operations are are are, are better on point which i'm going to do uh, learning and innovation. I challenge my staff to not be one dimensional, uh, not, not be sort of, you know, singular thinking and that, okay, this is how we've done it. This is how we're always going to do it. Get out there, do clinics, um, expand yourself. That's important to us. Uh, and then the quantitative performance, that's not just your win loss record, uh, which is critical, but also how are we doing academically? Our academic numbers have been off the charts. Um, you know, we had 14 Dean's list guys, uh, GPA uh, as a team, uh, we finally got it over a 3.0. Uh, we, we've been fighting for that um, as a, a cumulative. Um, we had like a 3.6 uh, term GPA. Everybody got a little bit of the corona, uh, the corona effect of having great GPAs, but our, ours is, is consistently up there. So all that stuff is, uh, is locked in on that. We already talked about a lot of this stuff. So offensive philosophy, I won't dig into that anymore. Uh, but any questions on all that stuff? I know I just talked for about 15 minutes straight and didn't, didn't take any breath. So any questions on all that stuff? First, before I even ask questions, Coach, that's, I mean, I've never – I've seen a lot of different breakdowns. Uh, I thought that was really a lead in the fact of uh, one having um, so tied into the school's mission. I think that's pretty genius in how you've uh, just – it's natural, like you said, but just to be able to articulate it and be able to um, – say it in a home visit, say it at a booster club, uh, whatever function. I think that's, that's really important because it just reemphasizes how much, how bought in you are to the university as a whole and not just basketball. Uh, and then secondly, uh, you talked about the, uh, the non-negotiables in your program and also some other ways to measure your success, which was, uh, which is really high level. Most people just put it all on wins and losses and graduation rates and APR, you know, if we want to be honest. So to have some tangible ways and some really detailed ways, um, credit to you. And it's no wonder why you're um, building it the way you're building it, Coach. Yeah. I give this uh, to my staff. This has all those things, those four pillars. And we keep it on our desk and we, we, we think about it. We talk about it. Um, but it's important to us. Yeah, let's get a few more questions for our coach has to run and go to his next Zoom. We know he's a man in demand, so we appreciate him spending so much time with us and being so open and sharing so much. So uh, anyone else that has questions, feel free. How's it going, Coach? Um, Darian Brown. What's up, bro? I had a question about your uh, your vision. You know, we all got visions as, as what we want to do and how we want to go about it. I'm a young guy. I wanted to know, like, um, how did you go about implementing your own vision without overstepping your boundaries as an assistant coach? He, he's he's from Dallas too, so we got to represent. <laughs> and my brother, uh, my brother's moving, so I might need y'all to go help him one day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Dallas, he lived he live down there. Um, so you mean my vision when I was an assistant personal coach? Personal vision, yes, sir. Yeah, my personal vision. So as you all know, uh, this isn't telling anybody anything they don't know. First and foremost, you got to be great at your current job. Um, I don't love the word loyal. Like I don't like talking about. it. I think that's just you just know that that's, you got to be loyal. Like that's just, if you're a good person, you're going to be loyal to your boss. You're going to be loyal to the institution that gave you a chance. Um, and so I never felt, I never felt worried that I was overstepping my bounds in terms of wanting to continue to develop. Um, and, and I also, you know, I talked about the coaches, all well, three of them I really worked for, and even Chris Collins for a couple months, they all wanted to see me grow. Uh, they all poured into my life. Uh, and, and so, you know, I talked a lot about Bill Carmody. I talked a lot about uh, John Thompson III. Uh, but Josh Pastner, who was the last coach I worked for, um, you know, being able to confidently walk into his office and say, look, you know, this job just opened. Um, you know, I don't know if I can get involved, but I'm very interested. And for him to right away put, pick up the phone and see what he could do to help, uh, that made a huge difference. And, you know, I would say, you know, that's a product of me being good for him right and so like I really put my heart and soul into trying to help my programs advance uh, as an assistant coach and so you know when I spent my time thinking about how I would develop a program or you know how I would develop a staff and all that type of stuff I never felt like I was cheating my program um, you know during that time because you know I knew that I was I was giving my all to, to what we need to do to be successful. Appreciate that coach. Yeah great question. Another great answer by Coach. Let's take uh, two or three more, and then we'll let Coach 
uh, kind of get on his way. How's it going, Coach? What's up, Jacob? Appreciate your time. You really gave us some some great knowledge, uh, kind of who you are and and, and your philosophies on, on how to coach and, and develop young men. My question for you is um, I'm at I'm an assistant basketball coach over at LSU Eunice. Uh, we're entering the third uh, the program's third year. So um, a lot of a lot of a lot of the things we discuss amongst the coaching staff um, in terms of doing the little things, I guess, to uh, not only brand uh, the university, but to also uh, have the abilities to bring in uh, players that are a little bit recruited highly than others and things like that. So um, I guess my question to you would be, what are some nuggets uh, that, that you would have for, uh, I, guess, I guess, for an assistant coach? Um, kind of the day in, day out, kind of things like that, that, that you do on a daily basis. Yeah. And so from a recruiting standpoint, um, you know, and again, I'm not big on, on rankings and all that type of stuff. Trust your eyes that you are identifying guys that maybe is undervalued. So I can go into a stock market uh, presentation. You know, if you're going to invest in stocks, it, it's, not, not the, it's not always the best to go you know, invest in Facebook, which is trade net, whatever the hell it's trade net. Um, you know, you got to find some undervalued stocks. Um, you got to find some guys that will buy into what you're building, what you guys are, are trying to do. Um, and, and that's the way we've attacked our domestic recruiting um, is getting some guys that maybe have been overlooked, uh, but we've seen uh, through evaluation, through getting to know them, that they're better than what people think. And so one of our, we had three freshmen on the uh, all Patriot League team, the all Patriot League rookie team. And two of them were big recruits because they were international. The other one is equally good, but nobody knew about him. He had one offer and it was us uh, because we put the work in to be able to find and identify him and, and, and we trusted our own eyes. But in terms of the, the actual story that you tell them, you know, I just believe it's got to be real. It's got to be authentic and you just got to say it with passion and conviction. Um, you got to let those, those, those guys know that, you know, you're going to do what you're telling them. Uh, you're going to do what you say you can do and that what you're saying is best for them. And hopefully yes, they sir. Can do it. Thank you. Great question to answer. And Coach Hardy, I'll piggyback that just to ask a question for Jacob in a sense. Uh, I think sometimes younger in your career or at parts in your career, maybe you feel like in order to get, there's pressure to perform in recruiting. So you feel like maybe you have to tell somebody something they want to hear or, you're going against a school that maybe you haven't gone against. So it's a little more intimidating, like you were talking about recruiting Mr. Basketball out of Georgia to Northwestern and Carmody's going to the in-home visit. And I think you're always, you've always been natural at being comfortable in your own skin and everyone doesn't have that. So I guess what would you speak to about um, just not really worrying about uh, the hype of a situation or certain things and just sticking to that integrity and just, really real recognized real kids want to be told the truth and they want to know they can trust you so if you if you don't mind just kind of adding on yeah no I mean truthfully and I'm going to say this in my next call where I'm speaking to a bunch of high school coaches from the DC area um, who are great men they've had phenomenal players I've tried to recruit their players everywhere they've had they have pros they've had you know Patriot League level guys they've had every everybody uh, from, you know, what, what's arguably the best basketball conference in the country uh, out here at the WCAC, uh, which is DeMatha, Gonzaga, all those folks. Um, what I'll say is this, like, I've, I've never had success in a situation where I had to say someone handed me a player. Um, I've never taken that approach. Uh, now, Am I cool with the AAU coaches to make sure they don't destroy me <laughs> and tell them that I ain't worth nothing? And same for the high school coaches. Um, I'm cool enough with them um, to where they understand. I look at it as, you know, I'm presenting to them the best case for their young men, so they want to see it too. But I, I, I steer clear of situations where someone has to deliver me a guy. Because usually if you're delivering something, there had to be something in return to get them delivered. <laughs> Uh, and, and so I, I, stay, I lock in on parents. Um, if you don't have a support system that 
is telling you the right things, I, I would have a hard time recruiting you. And that, that happened everywhere I was. Um, you know, I've never worked for a coach. Um, and I'd say straight up, you know, Pastner was, Pastner, uh, was good at, you know, finessing relationships, um, you know, in a way that, you know, other guys didn't. But, and that's not a bad thing. Um, but for the most part, for me, like, you know, recruiting Jose Alvarado to Georgia Tech, who's going to be one of the top ACC point guards next year, he had a strong parental uh, structure. You know, they weren't wealthy. They weren't, you know, but they believed in the best environment for their, for their young man. And, uh, you know, we were able to, to get that out just by being authentic. We locked in on, on building and showing that relationship, how it was going to, how it was going to translate when he got to college. Thank you, Coach. Hey, Coach, I got one last thing for you, man, before I head out of here. I, I grew up in Chicago. My wife is from Baltimore. And my uh, kids were uh, born and raised in, uh, here in Atlanta. So is okay. it Chicago deep dish Polish sausage, Atlanta's chicken and waffle, or Boston or uh, Baltimore's uh, crabs? What's your choice? Yeah, so. Hey, that's the best question all night. <laughs> that, is a, that is a great, that is a great. You got to say Chicago best so I could, so I could win for the, for this I mean, it, it's, it's, it's going to be Chicago. Now, mind Jot you. Down. Jot down. Yeah, mind you, I spent most of my life in Chicago. And so you, you hit them both on the head. Like every time I go back, I got to either hit, I'm more of a Lou Malnati's guy than a Giordano's or Gino's East. I'm, I, so I hit Lou's every time and I hit Portillo's every time. Um, you know, so I, hopefully I'm there long enough where I can hit both without gaining too much weight. But no, it's it's it, it's a must. But you know, again, my people from Mississippi, so I enjoy uh, the soul food down in Atlanta. Um, you know, in, in Baltimore, I'm still I'm still finding my way. Like, you know, I mean, I, the crab is, you know, this is one thing you see at Baltimore. You you go to a club, right? And I don't go like I used to, but. I'm, I'm, we all family here. I know it's recorded and everything, but you end up at the club in Baltimore and you see people decked out like, you know, fellas and they, they, they button downs and they, you know, doing their thing. The girls got on the nice dresses and all that stuff. And then they sit down at a table and just lay out some brown paper bags and just take crabs and just yank them joints and bite them like just nasty, like, and they all got obey on them everywhere. And like, it's just like, Obey spread out on their dresses. <laughs> now they, I would spill it. They don't spill it. But uh, it's just different, man. I love Baltimore, but crab, like, that's too much work, man. And I sweat quick. And I, don't, I can't do it. Like, somebody broke it up for me. Like, back in the day, my mom, like, she used to make ham hocks or something. They used to pick out the meat and give me a bowl of it. And I ain't have to get all up into it. If it's like that, I'm cool with it. But if I got to... If I got to crack it and twist it and dig out the little nasty stuff, I can't do it. Too much work. Too much uh, work. My wife makes fun of me. My wife makes fun of me all the time. Yep. Man, I'm at the club. Like, I ain't trying to – I'm trying to bop a little bit. <laughs> I don't blame you, Coach. I stick to crab cakes. Yeah, I can, I can do that. <laughs> I think uh, I think Coach Brian, Coach, you had one one uh, one question. We'll take one more if we have any, and then we'll shut it down. Before he asked, I, Nicole Collins, you had the Northwestern thing on there. You go to Northwestern or work at Northwestern? No, no, no. It's a it's a our, was our regional tournament. Oh, okay. I'm in high school. Yeah, I'm in high school in Texas. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. And take and taking diligent notes, coach. You feel free to ask a question now. You're on the spot now. Oh, I'm, I mean, well, I'm assuming, I'm assuming coach. Car I'm assuming coach Carruthers brought you on, right? Yeah, she did. She did. He does that. Um, he does that. Off top, one thing I was just thinking about, just because this has just kind of been a kind of a focus in an area that I've been paying attention to with our girls. Like when y'all are working on skill development. Now, granted, we're in high school, you're in college, but when y'all are working on skill development, do you have issues with? Your, your guys translating it to the floor? And if so, what are some things that you feel like have helped you? Because obviously we've been blessed with some really great athletes, some great basketball players, but I've got some kids that are young and they're athletic, but in terms of just the skill of the game that they really need, and I think I'm, I've got a really solid staff that we do, that's something we really focus on, we're good on details, but it just seems like when I go to watch them play during the summer now, it's just there's a, there's a breakdown. There's something that's not happening. You're doing it in practice, but not seeing it in the game. 
And even with some of them, you're not doing it in practice. And I was just kind of wondering, do you, do you struggle with that on the college level? If so, what are some things that you've done to help with that? Yeah, so I, I would say I'm, if you would, I'm, I'm like a Princeton cousin, right? Uh, I'm not a Princeton member per se. Like I didn't, I didn't go to Princeton. If you ask a Princeton coach this, they would like bash every drill, every cone drill. Like, like they don't want to see you do anything that you don't do in a game. Like every workout that we had was game. Like uh, it all had to translate. If, 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 if I, if Carmody walked in the gym and I had some cones on the court or something, like he would kick me out as a coach. Um, the reason I, I preface that by saying I'm not that, because I do believe that stuff is important, but I think you got to have both. And so, you know, I think from a confidence standpoint, we talk, we, we say swag a lot. I might be getting outdated. I might be getting too old, but I'm more of a Jay-Z guy. Actually, I do like little Baby, though. Um, hey, swag, swag doesn't get outdated, coach. They don't get outdated. Yeah, but so we say, we talk about swag. And so how do you develop swag? You know, some of it is the, the repetition that happens when you're working with those trainers and you're learning how to stay low and dribble through a cone and jump over this and do that. And, and so, like, I want them to, to do that stuff. We're just not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. Yeah. Um, and I want the assistant coaches to, to be as creative as they want in terms of things that they believe in. I don't, I don't micromanage that. Uh, I'm not, you know, if, if I come in there and they got 50,000 things on the floor, I'm cool with it. But then just know that we're not going to spend that much time on that stuff in practice. In practice, we're going to do a lot of the things that are going to translate into the games. We shoot a lot of game shots. Um, right. you know, and, and to me, that's what I want to spend my time on. But I don't fault mm -hmm. the, the other folks for spending their time on the other stuff. And I do think it's value to it for our guys. Right. Thank all you. Right. Appreciate you all. Before, because I had to run, I don't like to be late. But I'm gonna put my email. Yeah, please, coach. And, and number. I'm not gonna do it all fancy like everybody else. So y'all just know T Hardy is me. Um, and I put my cell in here. Now I know Julian's probably like, man, he gonna hit you back, but he gonna hit you back late. That's the truth. Like, I, <laughs> they not respond right away. <laughs> Uh, but I always mean what I say, like, and so like me and Julian, we're going to get together Friday. I know that. Just just bear with me sometimes. Uh, no, that sounds good, coach. I got four I kids, know. man, and, and we all under quarantine, so uh, <laughs> I can't move. I can't move that, that well, but uh, oops, I was sending that privately to somebody. As, like, as, you as you type in the chat, I'll just say, coach, big time having you on, man. Um, I think it's obvious to everybody. <laughs> who doesn't know you and those that do know you already know this, but just, man, just so high level of a communicator, of a person down to earth, still having fun with the game and still having fun in life, uh, connecting to people, treat people, make people feel like they're important. And I think you're just, just going to continue to do great things there and, um, and, and with your family and anything else you do in this business, it's going to be gold just like it has been, man. So appreciate your time today. You were awesome. As good of a guest as we've ever had. Had, so appreciate that and uh thanks everyone for coming on i appreciate you all take care love you shelly thank you